Hi there, my name is Jordan Kistler and I'm a lecturer in Victorian literature at the University of Strathclyde. Um, I work broadly in the field of literature and science and more specifically I've been working on a cultural history of the British Museum in the 19th century and today I'm going to talk to you about truth and fantasy in the Victorian Museum. In 1845, the fossil hunter and showman Albert Cock unveiled the skeleton of a 114 foot long sea serpent that he dubbed Hydrarchos, or King of the Water. Advertised as a leviathan of the antediluvian world, sovereign master and greatest monument of all animal creation, Cock proclaimed that the serpent both reigned as a most tyrannical, cruel and unconquerable monarch of the prehistoric past and offered concrete proof of the continued existence of sea serpents, answering not only in its colossal size, but also in other respects, remarkably to the description given of a monster, which many respectable citizens have stated under oath that they have seen swimming alive on the ocean. At 114 feet in length, the Hydrarchus was, as Cock proclaimed, without exception, the largest of all fossil skeletons found, either in, found in either the Old or New World. It was also, of course, a hoax. Cock had cobbled together several specimens of uh, Basilosaurus, a prehistoric whale, along with ordinary pieces of rock to create his superspinal column. Despite the fact that legitimate naturalists revealed Koch's fraud soon after the Hydrarchus' first appearance in New York, Koch continued on to display his skeleton to large crowds throughout Europe and finally sold his specimen to the Anatomical Museum in Berlin for a generous sum. Sale to a real museum, not a showroom or a dime museum, would seem to offer legitimacy to both Koch and his specimen. A fact made all the more surprising as the Hydrarchos was not Koch's first supersized swindle. Three years earlier, he had exhibited, to much fanfare in both the States and Europe, his Missourium, a mastodon-like creature of enormous proportions. Standing at 15 feet in height and 30 in length, the Missourium, or Missouri Leviathan, was advertised as being so large that between its legs, the mammoth and even the mighty iguanodon may easily have crept. The advert insisted that the Missourium is universally acknowledged by men of science to be the greatest phenomenon ever discovered in natural history. And in fact, Koch was able to drum up support from men of science to the point that he was invited to give a lecture on the Missourium to the Geological Society of London. Though the relationship of the Missourium to the Mastodon was evident to even a casual viewer, Cox's description of what the animal had been like in life was far different from the Mastodon, which resembled both the mammoth and the modern-day elephant. Cox's Missourium, in contrast, had, he insisted, prehensile thumbs on all four feet, which enabled the animal to feed itself, quote, in the manner of a beaver. Perhaps even more surprising, Cock claimed the creature was a predator, quote, of enormous magnitude, ferocity, and strength that could attack the largest animal with impunity. It was protected by, he said, alligator-like armor, such that no barbed iron, harpoon, or spear would make any impression. And, if that wasn't enough, Cock argued that the Missourium was fully aquatic, swimming with terrifying fleetness due to its webbed feet. Here in this description, Cock enacts a double fantasy of the past and of the present. He reinforces the public belief that anything gigantic from the prehistoric past must have been predatory, an idea explored by scholars like Richard Fallon, who traces the idea of the carnivorous Brontosaurus into 20th century pulp fiction, and the idea of American greatness, a belief that everything is bigger in the New World. The Missourium was exhibited at the Egyptian Hall Piccadilly, drawing huge crowds that included the geologists Gideon Mantell and William Buckland, and the comparative anatomist and future superintendent of the Natural History Departments of the British Museum, Richard Owen.
These visits from the most prominent British scientists of the day were reported on in the popular press as a testament to the fossil's authority, to the fossil's authenticity. Thus, one paper reported that Professor Buckland and a committee appointed to report on the matter have earnestly recommended that Mr. Cox's most valuable collection should not be allowed on any account to leave the country. And, in fact, it was not. The Missourium was purchased for the phenomenal price of £1,300 by the British Museum. The entire annual budget for the museum in 1842, the year of the purchase, was £30,000, so this was a large expenditure indeed. As with the Hydrarchos, the purchase of the Missourium lent it an air of authenticity. As the London Saturday Journal reported, the vastness of the skeleton has led some persons to impugn its authenticity. However, this is a point for the scientific to settle. And as the skeleton has been visited by Professor Owen, Dr. Buckland, and other distinguished comparative anatomists and geologists, a more distinct illustration of this wonder may be shortly expected. Of this, there is allowed no doubt that the skeleton in question is the genuine fossil relic of some gigantic animal of other ages. Buckland's report and the museum's eventual purchase of the Missourium seemed to offer the verification this writer sought. Yet, when it was purchased for the staggering sum of £1,300, Owen, Buckland, Mantell, and others were well aware that the skeleton had been assembled in error, to quote Owen. In fact, just as he would do three years later with the Hydrarchus, Cock had built his Missourium out of several specimens of Mastodon, expanding its proportions in all directions with extra bones. Knowing that Cock was a huckster and that the Missourium was a fraud, the most prominent naturalists of the day both praised his work and encouraged the museum to purchase his collection. Why? <clears throat> the museum purchased the skeleton not because it represented a new species, a supersized, terrifying leviathan, but because within the creature Cock built was the skeleton of a mastodon, which, quote, illustrates the ostology of the gigantic mastodon far more completely than any other collection of North American fossils brought to Europe, as Richard Owen reported to the Geological Society of London. Furthermore, Lucas Ripple argues that the kindness shown to Cock who was gently corrected in his mistakes and errors, and never called out on his deliberate attempts at fraud, served two purposes. It first maintained a good relation between practicing naturalists and the fossil hunters who supplied them with bones. Men like Richard Owen did no field work for themselves. Instead, they relied on people like Cock to actually find fossils. Thus, it was important to keep relations friendly. Second, Ripple argues that the characterization of Cox's work as the result of error was an important tool in shoring up the authority of the trained naturalists. Ripple suggests that the reactions to the Missourium uh, was part of a wider strategy of policing the divide between the collectors and the naturalists. By saying that Cox wasn't a fraud, but merely confused, the professional naturalist suggested he was unable to interpret the bones that he found only a trained comparative anatomist could interpret fossils correctly. Thus, Ripple demonstrates that mid-century naturalists continued to praise Cock as a valued member of their community, albeit one who lacked the skill or standing to offer authoritative pronouncements on controversial matters of scientific debate. What I am interested in, however, is how the public interpreted the purchase of the fraudulent specimen for the National Museum. <clears throat> As we have already seen, approval from Owen, Buckland and Mantell was implicitly taken as confirmation of the authenticity of the specimen. Furthermore, the reports of the sale made many months after Owen and others publicly confirmed that the Missourium never existed, were phrased to suggest that the museum intended to display the Missourium as Cock had assembled it. Thus, a Dublin paper reported that the British Museum was in the process of purchasing the extraordinary skeleton, which has for this time past excited the wonder of our good citizens. The paper then encouraged readers to 
gratify themselves by the inspection of Mr. Cox's museum and its great feature of attraction, the Missourium, which continues to excite the wonder of the hundreds who visit it daily, before the skeleton would move on to Paris. The paper thus implies that the extraordinary skeleton would soon be on display at the British Museum, just as it had been at the Egyptian Hall, exciting the wonder of all who saw it. This was not the case. Owen assisted the British Museum in the re-articulation of the skeleton according to actual scientific data, and ended up with a regular mastodon, which you can still see in the Hinsey Hall of the Natural History Museum in London. While Ripple suggests that Owen and others intended this correction to establish the authority of trained anatomists and naturalists, it had the opposite effect on the public. The case was widely reported as if the museum and all its experts had been taken in by Cox fraud and had paid a huge sum of money for nothing but chicanery. Thus, London's Morning Post gleefully reported that the Missourium could be seen now so greatly reduced in size in the British Museum, whither it was taken with its fraudulent additions from the Egyptian Hall a few years ago. Here, the public is perhaps reassured that they were not the only ones fooled by the spectacular display at the Egyptian Hall. Even the experts were taken in. But the great reduction of the Missourium also serves to undermine that very expertise. It is this that I am interested in, the ways in which the museum attempted to construct its own authority and the ways in which the public did or did not accept that authority. Instances like the Missourium undermined public trust in the British Museum and the knowledge it displayed, revealing to public scrutiny that much of the knowledge displayed in the museum is by necessity speculative, an idea that sits uneasily alongside the museum's supposed role as a purveyor of objective facts. The public mockery that followed the purchase of the Missourium likely explains why, in spite of what Ripple has argued about the politics of keeping fossil collectors happy, but in their place, by 1846, Owen was characterizing the articulation of the Missourium as far more than a mistake, saying that the specimen was the most grotesquely distorted and exaggerated apposition of the bones he had ever seen. Equally, Owen reacted to the hoax of the Hydrarchus far more harshly than he initially did the Missourium. He wrote to the Times in 1848 to, dis to dispute even the possibility of sea serpents. But I am usually asked, after an alleged sighting, why should there not be a great sea serpent? Often, too, in a tone which seems to imply, do you think then that there are not more marvels in the deep than are dreamt of in your philosophy? I'm freely conceding that point. I have felt bound to give a reason for skepticism as well as faith. Having gone through various reasons for his skepticism, including the absence of any verified sea serpent bones in any museum in the world, Owen concluded this letter, saying, I regard the negative evidence from the utter absence of any of the recent remains of great sea serpents, krakens, or inaliosauria Inali as stronger against their actual existence than the positive statements which have hitherto weighed with the public mind in favour of their existence. A larger body of evidence from eyewitnesses might be got together in proof of ghosts than the sea serpent. Owen's insistence that if sea serpents were real, there would be material evidence on display in museums makes clear the equation of museums with authenticity and truth during this period. As one paper argued, they were willing to take the word of the sailors who claimed they saw sea serpents, but understood that their op understood their opponents who, quote, say they will not believe in the serpent until they have seen its skeleton in the British Museum. Yet, one could see many things in a museum, even the British Museum, that were not, in fact, real. Around the same time as the spectacle of the Missourium, a series of high-profile misidentifications, frauds, and forgeries shook the public's trust in the museum and its ability to verify and authenticate. And perhaps the public was right to be suspicious, 
as the display strategies employed by the museum were intended to confirm the truth of the collection, while also disguising the acts of interpretation and outright fabrication that took place within its walls. Throughout much of the 19th century, the exhibits of the British <clears throat> The exhibits of the British Museum were unlabeled and even uncatalogued, for the public anyway. Instead, the museum displayed its collections based on the principle that truth inheres in the object itself and is visible to the untrained eye in the form of object lessons. This belief was evident in discussions of the pedagogical function of the museum. Thus, in 1853, the Liverpool Mercury described the museum as a great educator, in which there was no need for explanations of the objects. Though no learned lecturer appears in formal phrase to the ear, the objects themselves do so through the eye, and the materials for thought which present themselves in such varied forms come forth from time to time in new and interesting shapes after undergoing fusion in the crucible of the mind. Merely by looking at an object, a 19th century viewer was supposed to be able to grasp all the information modern visitors expect to find on a label, identification, historical and cultural context, and significance. This belief was based on a platonic notion of absolute truth visible in the object. As Csikszentmihalyi and Robinson explain, approaches to aesthetics based on the concept of the platonic ideal stress the belief that art represents not the limited particularities of the world of appearances, but the underlying eternal forms behind them. Thus, the Daily News insisted in 1848 that a museum visitor could grasp an almost complete picture of the religious, civil, and warlike life of the Assyrian kings merely from viewing the artifacts discovered in the ruins of Nineveh. The whole truth of the civilization is embedded in each fragmentary object, each of the earrings, necklaces, bracelets, arms, thrones, furniture, vases, and the carriages which were in use at the court of Nineveh. More than that, the truth revealed by the gaze was believed to be immediately communicable to each viewer. Thus, champions of the pedagogical use of the museum insisted that a mere glimpse or glance at the collection could educate. This belief was, in part, predicated on the idea that muse museums display that which is really real, unmediated by curatorial interpretation. 19th century museums drew a distinction between indexical displays, those which were a material trace of the past, and iconic displays, which offered a mere likeness, such as the historical paintings routinely displayed in the museum. Ripple notes that, quote, curators worried that icons were vulnerable to distortion by the subjective and perhaps even erroneous beliefs of whoever had fashioned them. In contrast, indexical representations were seen as nothing more than a material trace of the past, immune to the effects of human intervention. In this view, the object itself was not vulnerable to subjective distortion, and neither was what it signified. Yet, as we have seen, the object itself was very often the product of human intervention and interpretation. For instance, in the posture in which a skeleton is mounted, um, as in this example of a megalosaurus on display at the Liverpool World Museum on the left, more realistic than the illustration on the right, but potentially still subject to errors. And even a lack of intervention could lead to uh, inaccuracies, as with the positioning of the tusks on the mesurium, which if we flip back, you can see curved back round the animal's head. Um, Koch found the skull with the tusks turned sideways so that they curved back around the skull almost like horns, and thus he mounted them in that position, insisting that when he discovered them, they were, quote, fixed in the socket, and thus the position had to be accurate. It was not, of course. The tusks of the mastodon are positioned much like the tusks of a modern elephant. We can see, therefore, that the object itself is subject to many different forms of distortion, from imperfections created over time, like the position of the tusks, to errors in display, to outright fraud.
These vulnerabilities are most evident in the case of restorations. When curators of the mid-century British Museum wished to offer interpretive material to their visitors, they most often chose to do so in the form of restorations rather than the label. For instance, a model showing how the Parthenon looked in the classical period. This is, I suggest, because restorations appear indexical rather than iconic, though of course they are not. They maintain the fantasy of direct engagement with an object unmediated by text, disguising acts of interpretation and imagination through their material reality. As Gabby Porter argues, when attached to material, physically evident objects, knowledge reads as known, certain, and authoritative. We can see this at work in the creation and reception of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, designed by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins in consultation with Richard Owen in the 1850s. Waterhouse Hawkins claimed that the sculptures served to revivify the ancient world, to call up from the abyss of time and from the depths of the earth those vast forms and gigantic beasts which the Almighty Creator designed with fitness to inhabit and precede us in this part of the earth called Great Britain. William Michael Rossetti confirmed this impression, insisting that an uninformed person will immediately and without labour gain from the models in the Sydenham Garden Lake as tolerable an idea of the appearance, habit and affinities of the antediluvians as the first science of the day can put into shape. Thus, like the authentic artefacts that we've already considered, these reconstructions were meant to speak for themselves. The relationship between these models and the appearance, habits and affinities of the antediluvians was authenticated by the first science of the day and the authority of the British Museum and the Crystal Palace. Yet, a comparison of the Crystal Palace Iguanodon with a contemporary reconstruction of the same animal reveals how much guesswork and imagination was at work in these reconstructions. The difference between Owen's Iguanodon and today's is really no less extreme than the difference between the Missourium, as mounted by Cock, and the Mastodon that Owen reassembled. One was honest error and one was fraud, but both undermine the museum's claim that absolute truth can be revealed immediately and without labour to even the uninformed visitor. This uneasy tension between the real and the unreal, the confirmed and the speculative, was evident throughout the museum's collection. In the 1840s, a restoration of the Parthenon was commissioned for the museum. Like the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, it was intended to aid the, quote, unlettered visitor. Now, the image on the slide is not of that recreation, which no longer seems to exist. Instead, this is the recreation of the Athena in the Parthenon, currently on display at Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum. As in the descriptions of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, authorities on the subject were quick to deny the iconicity of the Parthenon restoration. A writer for the Athenaeum ins thus insisted, any merely conjectural reconstruction could have satisfied none of the serious demands of the subject, while it would have been an unpardonable assumption that affected to clothe the fancy of the artist with the sanctions of the highest authority known to art. It is clear that the writer feels the authority of the museum would be explicitly challenged by any hint of fancy in these productions. Yet, of course, the model necessarily was the product of inference and speculation. And thus, the writer for the Athenaeum admits, Mr. Lucas has carefully consulted with the authorities on the subject, both those of fact and speculation, remains and drawings of remains, with the opinions of scholars as to the interpretation of these where their language is obscure, and where, all these failing him, it has been necessary to connect the known by the unknown, he has taken the principles upon which Phidias wrought for his guide and sought only in what is expressed for what is meant. In this description, facts, authority, scholars, and principles sit in uneasy juxtaposition with speculation, opinions, interpretation, and the unknown. 
revealing the tensions that come with any restoration. The Athenaeum attempts to smooth over this tension by claiming that Lucas connects the known by the unknown, mediating between the invisible and the visible in order to produce a work of reality. Yet it is necessarily conjectural and unverifiable. Like Waterhouse Hawkins and Owen, in the case of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, Lucas was doing the best he could with the information he had. Yet Jean Baudrillard has suggested that the mere presence of restorations destabilizes reality. He argues that simulation, in contrast to dissimulation or lying, disrupts the reality principle. In cases of dissimulation, the difference between true and false always remains clear. The truth is the opposite of the lie. In contrast, quote, simulation threatens the difference between true and false, between real and imaginary. As Baudrillard argues, it is no longer a question of a false representation of reality, but of concealing the fact that the real is no longer real. Because they were unlabeled and displayed alongside real or authentic objects, Restorations introduced doubt into the museum, as visitors could not be sure if they were looking at an authentic object or a speculative restoration. Thus, it was sensationally reported early in the century that uh, we are almost ashamed to be the first to publish the fact, but it is publicly and confidently stated that the splendid Saurian remains lately purchased by the trustees of the British Museum for £500 or guineas is nothing else than plaster. As with the later incident of the Missourium, the paper here implies that a fraud has been committed upon the naive and foolish trustees of the British Museum. Of course, plaster casts of fossil, fossils are commonly displayed in museums, but it's clear that the presence of casts destabilizes truth claims across the museum's holdings, particularly when the difference between the real and the imitation was not clearly articulated to visitors. And as I have been suggesting, visitors were right to doubt, as the lines between well-meaning guesswork, foolish errors, and deliberate fraud were blurry at best, and the museum used the same strategy seen above with the restorations to verify that which they knew either to be unverifiable or outright false. Thus, in speaking to a parliamentary commission of 1847-50, to 50, the archaeologist Charles Fellows accused Richard Westmacott, who served as an unofficial advisor to the British Museum, of planning to alter artifacts that Fellows had collected in Turkey in order to, quote, make them perfectly Greek. Westmacott's planned display was, Fellows insisted, entirely fancy, without any tie as to the countries they came from or the age of the sculpture. Westmacott's planned display was a far cry from exhibiting the past as it really was, as the museum promised that it did. Instead, he suggested defacing the artifacts, including putting the inscription from one onto another to make them conform to his idea of that which was perfectly Greek. And it's clear here that to be perfectly Greek was more than being sculpture from Greece, which, of course, these were not, but rather meant to be like the rest of the Greco-Roman collection at the British Museum. That is, like the Parthenon marbles, long held up as the pinnacle of artistic achievement. Thus, this understanding of what was perfectly Greek was itself generated by the museum and its other holdings. Westmacott suggested reformatting the Lycian collection to be more aesthetically pleasing to the modern connoisseur whose taste for classical marbles was shaped by the works already displayed in the museum. Yet the Parthenon marbles, too, were displayed in line with a fancy or fantasy of that which was perfectly Greek, which did not accord with actual historical fact. By the 1850s, it was widely recognized by experts that the statuary of ancient Greece and Rome had been painted. 
And in line with this, the Crystal Palace at Sydenham displayed its casts of the Parthenon marbles brightly painted. The British Museum, however, though very happy to display Lucas's speculative model of the Parthenon, resisted any ingress of polychromy within its walls. The official guidebook of the British Museum in 1856, for instance, describes the Parthenon marbles in detail, insisting on the veracity of the display, without ever mentioning the fact that the statues were once painted in bright colours. The bas relief which compose this frieze are arranged, as nearly as can be ascertained, in the order in which they were originally placed in the Parthenon, several alterations having been made on their removal to their present situation, in consequence of a more careful examination and minute comparison of them with drawings made before the removal from the temple. Scholars like Kate Nichols have argued that the whiteness of Greek statuary was considered integral to its status as the ideal, the benchmark of universal standards of beauty and art. Even further, the whiteness of these sculptures was insidiously associated with the perceived whiteness of the ancient world, which served to suggest that the achievements of the Greco-Roman world were part of the legacy of the Caucasian race arguments still made today by white supremacist groups here and in America. As Margaret Talbot writes, what could be initially dismissed as an error, similar to that of the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, um, the paint on the sculptures very often had disappeared by the time they were unearthed by treasure hunters and archaeologists, soon became a fantasy. Scholars argued that Greek and Roman artists had left their buildings and sculptures bare as a pointed gesture. It both confirmed their superior rationality and distinguished their aesthetic from non-Western art. Acceptance of this view was made easier by the fact that ancient Egyptian sculptures looked very different. Coloured sculpture was thus associated, in part because of the display strategies of the British Museum, with savagery while whiteness of both sculpture and skin was a sign of civilization. Thus, Philip Henry Stanhope, who was instrumental in founding the National Portrait Gallery in 1856, insisted, it is said there is some precedent for painting statues in the classic times of Greece. But without entering into the argument here, I must say that I question the fact and altogether deny the inference. It seems to me that the practice, so far, far from recalling the best Grecian age, would rather bring to mind some barbaric era. Would you judge of it for yourselves? Compare then the genuine Elgin marbles in the British Museum, as they gleam in true pentelic brightness, with the pink and red copies in the Crystal Palace at Sydenham, and you will see that what is beautiful in the one is little better than a caricature in the other. Under the guidance of men like Stanhope, the museum willfully ignored the evidence for painted sculpture, because it ran counter to the hierarchies of art that it created and reinforced through its displays, with that which was perfectly Greek, representing the highest artistic achievement possible. Thus, G. H. Lewis, a defender of polychromy, was forced to admit that in order to reflect on the historical development of sculpture, an interested party would need to get out of all sculpture galleries. Truth was not to be found in the museum. While speculation, interpretation and error are usually invisible to the museum visitor, disguised by display strategies that suggest certainty and truth, the polychromy issue was starkly visible to even the most unlettered museum goer of the 1850s, as the very same statues were presented simultaneously as pure white in the British Museum and coloured at the Crystal Palace. Visitors who visited both sites were thus uniquely confronted with conflicting interpretations of the past and were forced to confront the idea that one of them was wrong despite the fact that both were backed by the government and endorsed by a bevy of high-profile experts. We can see then that even the display of artifacts exactly as they were discovered, as with the 
seemingly unpainted statues, can promote certain ideologies over others. The apparent indexical nature of the display disguising acts of interpretation by way of exclusion, here of evidence for painted surfaces. In the instance of polychromy, the British Museum displayed that which it knew to be untrue, a fantasy of ideal whiteness. At the same time, in other galleries, the museum sought to verify the unverifiable. The census of 1851 revealed what some believed to be alarming statistics about church-going within Britain. With over 4 million people not attending Sunday morning services in churches or chapels without any cause of inability, a further 5.5 million absenting themselves from the afternoon services, and 6.5 million skipping the evening services. With a full quarter of the population not attending services of any kind, the church and the government set out to try and reinforce religious belief in the populace. One way this was enacted was through the museum. In Literature and Dogma, published in 1873, Matthew Arnold insisted that the Bible is unverifiable. It is because we cannot trace God in history that we stay the craving of our minds with a fancy account of him, made up by putting scattered expressions of the Bible together and taking them literally. The language of the Bible is fluid, passing, and literary, not rigid, fixed, and scientific, Arnold reminded his readers. As Jill Hicks Keaton and Kevin Concannon insisted in their investigation of the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., the Bible does not exist. There are only Bibles. For centuries, humans have made, circulated, and read Bibles of many shapes and sizes in differing languages with varied lists of texts, with variant words, with particularized constraints on interpretation and practices of encounter, end quote. In the face of the unverifiable nature of the literary Bible, or Bibles, scholars, curators, and church officials in the mid-19th century attempted to shore up the authority of the Christian church by shifting their evidence from textual to material proofs. Archaeology, which seemed rigid, fixed, and scientific, in Arnold's words, appeared to enable historians to trace God in history. Thus, new artifacts from Assyria, unearthed in the 1840s and 1850s, were deemed valuable to the museum and to the public because they were seen to verify the literal truth of the Bible. This was the purpose assigned to Austin Henry Layard's excavations at Nineveh, by the museum, the press, and by Layard himself. For example, in his popular account of his discoveries, published in 1851, Layard frames his discovery of monumental winged sculptures, which you can see on the slide, in terms of communion with the patriarchs of the Bible. He writes, I have already described my feelings when gazing for the first time on these majestic figures. Those of the reader would probably be the same, particularly if caused by the reflection that before those wonderful forms, Ezekiel, Jonah, and others of the prophets stood and Sennacherib bowed that even the patriarch Abraham himself may possibly have looked upon them. This first-hand confirmation and communion with the Bible and its patriarchs was not reserved just for adventurers willing to brave the Near East, however. The transcendent experience that Layard describes was available to every visitor of the British Museum, and Layard's popular account primed a great many of them. It sold 12,000 copies in a single year, to view these objects through a religious lens. Thus, one newspaper insisted that the new exhibits at the museum serve to clear up the mists that hung over these oriental regions, establishing beyond a doubt the authenticity of those passages of holy writ which the skeptic has been pointing to for ages with the finger of scorn, demanding the reconciliation Reconcilement of the history with sensible evidences from the scenes of the events. These objects seemed, to many, to answer those demands and to silence the scorn of the skeptics. <laughs> 
The Aberdeen Journal made the political and ideological goals of these new, new exhibits even more explicit, praising the Nineveh collection for offering marvellous corroboration of the facts of the holy volume, especially at a period when its truths are impugned and assailed by the socialist and the infidel, and when even philosophy, falsely so called, is leagued against its authority. Here then, the museum becomes a tool to counteract the socialist and the infidel, those who would question the Bible, the church, and by extension, the sovereignty of Britain itself. What's important is that the value of these objects, stunning works of art and important historical documents, is not that they elucidate the past, but that they fortify the present against biblical skepticism. And this led to the founding in 1856 of a scriptural museum in London. This collection was intended, according to the archaeologist Henry Rawlinson, to offer, quote, quite sufficient proof, if any proof were wanting, of the authenticity of holy writ. Though Rawlinson suggests that proof is not wanting, the existence of the scriptural museum makes clear that those in power believed it was and thought that material remains in the form of, quote, maps, plans, and views of interesting parts of the East, models, buildings, fruit, flowers, animals, implements, dresses, musical instruments, specimens of minerals, waters, antiquities, sculptures, or casts, and so on, were the best way to reinforce belief amongst the population. Now, whatever one's own beliefs are about Christianity and the Bible, the Bible as a static, definitive and unified piece of writing, which can be proven to be literally true, is a fantasy. As Hicks, Keaton and Con Cannon argue, quote, the Bible does exist in the realm of the imagination. The Bible exists as a social construct, a cultural icon a conceptual category that can variously offer affiliation and designate boundaries, platform political aims, and provide ideological resources." End quote. The Scriptural Museum and the growing Assyrian collection in the British Museum displayed not the literal truth of the Bible, but rather this social construct, which served a number of political and ideological aims. Increased church going amongst the working classes was the solution offered by many to the problem of what one Scottish newspaper described as, quote, the drunken, dog fighting, rat catching, wife beating populations of the great metropolis. It was supposed to quell revolution, cure drunkenness, and increase labor. The Scriptural Museum and the British Museum sought through legitimate material remains of the past to verify the unverifiable. They could, of course, verify the existence of ancient civilizations in the locations named in the Bible, as when Laird identified the site of the ancient city of Nineveh, and the existence of many of the people named in the Bible, as when Rawlinson discovered cuneiform slabs charting the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, but the material remains of the past would never be able to verify the raising of Lazarus, the feeding of the 5,000, or the conversion of water into wine. If these events occurred, they were ephemeral, leaving no material traces. The Scriptural Museum, therefore, displayed a construct in much the same way that Koch did at the Egyptian Hall. Legitimate material remains of the past, assembled in such a way as to create a fantasy, meant to reinforce certain beliefs about the past and the present. What each of these instances, the counterfeit sea serpent, the mega mastodon, the crystal palace dinosaurs and the reconstructed Parthenon, the pure white marbles and the scriptural museum, all demonstrate is the way in which 19th century museums attempted to use materiality to disguise the acts of interpretation, speculation, and invention that go into all museum displays. Fantasy and imagination enter museums in all sorts of guises. They ask us to imagine ourselves into the past or onto other planets or into the future, revivifying ancient life and envisioning what new life forms might arise. For the most part, as I've been suggesting, these 
acts of imagination, the presence of fantasy remains invisible, disguised by the materiality of the objects exhibited. It becomes explicit only in those cases like those I've considered here, when new scientific information reveals errors in the past and when frauds or deceptions are uncovered. Yet it is always present. As Will Tattersdale points out in his work, in the case of one of the most quintessential of museum objects, the dinosaur, all dinosaurs are always works of science fiction. No person has ever seen a living dinosaur, and thus every image of one is as much a work of fiction as it is a product of scientific inquiry, an argument that can be extended to much of what is displayed of the historical past. So I want to end this talk with a brief consideration of a present day institution that brings this interplay of fantasy and reality to the fore through its very unique remit. The Loch Ness Centre and Exhibition in Drumnadrakit, Scotland. I recently had the pleasure of visiting the former designer of the exhibition, Adrian Shine, to discuss the ways in which the centre navigates the line between fact and fantasy in its promise to, quote, explore the mystery and discover the history of the famous lock. I've been interested here, I've been interested in this talk in the way in which materiality of museum objects obscures the role of imagination and fantasy in their interpretation and display. The Loch Ness Centre, in contrast, lacks that materiality. As Adrian says, the exhibition has, quote, neither hide nor hair nor tooth nor bone of a monster within its collection. What this absence does is push the usually invisible fantasy to the fore. Not, I'm arguing, the fantasy of the existence of the monster, though the exhibition does of course trade on that, but rather it exposes the usually hidden or invisible fantasy of the purpose of museums, the idea that they exist to provide clear answers and stable truths. Throughout the exhibition, which seeks to expose hoaxes, like the famous surgeon's photo on the slide, and outdated theories, like the idea that there might be a plesiosaur in the lake, while simultaneously keeping wonder and mystery alive, truth becomes a murky proposition, as slippery and difficult to pin down as the monster itself. The exhibition is structured loosely around a chronology of technological advancements that allowed people to search for the monster in new ways, from photography to sonar to the Rosetta Project sediment core sampler. Each advancement provided exciting new information about the lake, which is detailed in the exhibition. Yet alongside that overt narrative of advancement is a counter narrative of scientific and technological limitation. Each new approach revealed things about the lake, but also was unable to conclusively solve the mystery of the monster. Furthermore, Adrian is a businessman as well as a man of science. And thus, while his overall goal was to use the monster controversy as a vehicle to talk about geology, biology, physics, habitats, and the environment, the exhibition leaves the question of the monster open through a rhetorical strategy that Adrian referred to as the ramp. Each of the seven rooms of the exhibition provided conclusive statements about the lake and the monster. For instance, that the plesiosaur concretely did absolutely die out, but then guided visitors to the next room using the ramp, a question or a mystery that reopened discussion of the monster. Thus, room one, which you can see on the slide, uh, the narration ends on the question, if Loch Ness is not a Jurassic Park, then what have a thousand eyewitnesses actually seen? The Loch Ness Centre, which is not a museum, but a business, and in Adrian's words, a show, thus exposes its relationship to certain fantasies more explicitly than do more conventional museums, as we saw with the whiteness of the Parthenon marbles. People want their worldviews confirmed, Adrian insisted. This is true of the visitors to the Parthenon room, where people expect to see white marble. 
a vision that confirms many subconscious beliefs about the classical world. The museum caters to this worldview without admitting that it does so. In contrast, the Loch Ness Centre knows that people visit because, though they may not actually believe, they'd like to, and thus the exhibition never completely disputes the existence of something in the lake. For this reason, the exhibition closed on Room 7, the Jury Room and Loch Ness Archives, which collected audio testimony of eyewitnesses and newspaper accounts of sightings. As an epilogue to the story of the lake, it serves to preserve a sense of possibility. You leave with the voices and the words of those who swear they've seen the monster echoing in your head, almost overriding some of the more legitimate science that is presented in the previous six rooms. Adrian noted that this final room was intended to give people the feeling that they had been given the chance to think for themselves. The center is, in some ways, the precise opposite of the scriptural museum in the 19th century or the contemporary museum of the Bible, where they use truth, real antiquities, to sell a fantasy, the Loch Ness Centre strives to use fantasy to sell some truth about the natural world. Yet for those who want to believe, the centre gave them enough leeway to do so. Uh, though perhaps visitors would leave with a slightly modified belief from the one they entered with. We can see in this example that the unreal or the fantastic is a tool that all museums use to draw in visitors, to fill in gaps in our knowledge of the world and the past, to influence what visitors think, and at times simply to confirm what visitors believe or want to be true. Thank you very much. I look forward to chatting with you all during the live Q&A session.